Hi everyone, thanks for coming today. I'm Dimitri, a software engineer at Red Hat and Postgres contributor, and it's actually my excuse why I'm so excited about the indexes and so on. So, and today we're going to talk about B3 indexes. And right away, right from the start, I would like to take you out of your comfort zone by stating that this is a B3. So can you even see something here? No, not really, right? Uh, it's actually a small, thin line, almost indistinguishable from like really nothing. So please raise your hand if you think that I'm bullshitting you right now. Yeah, that's the spirit. That's the spirit. Do not trust anybody. Anyone else? Cool, but in this case, I'm completely honest. So the thing is, it's a real B3 index that I have created using PGBench on a test setup. And the only reason why it looks so strange and almost invisible on these projectors is because it's visualized using GraphViz uh, with a normal regular, uh, regular layout from top to bottom. And maybe you have heard about this, B3s are extremely bright. So every single node contains a lot of pointers within it, which means that if you'll try to visualize it in this way, that's essentially what we get. Just a simple line, almost indistinguishable and almost invisible. Now, if we'll change the layout a little bit, yeah, now at least we can see a structure. So it's a, the, same, the very same data graph this, but just visualized with Neato. Uh, and you see that's exactly proving the point. The B trees are actually extremely you know, bushy in this regard, and we see there is some certain structures in it. So why am I showing this? Uh, I would like to demonstrate using this example that B trees are actually, they are usually more trickier and more interesting than people used to think about them. And well, I mean, I'm not an exception. Usually before this research, I was actually thinking about B-trees in a very same way. I was thinking that it's something pretty much static, you know, classical, uh, almost dusty, so nothing exciting is happening about this anymore. And, uh, well, at least one part of these statements is pretty much correct. So it's very much old thing. Uh, you see in already in the 80s, B-trees were considered to be a ubiquitous, so pretty much everything was benefiting from B-trees. Uh, but the second part of the statements turns out to be completely false when I have stumbled upon this interesting work called Modern B-tree Techniques, which eventually, as you can imagine, became an inspiration for this talk. There were a lot of many interesting techniques and very interesting approaches, how to optimize B-trees, how to modify them, and even some pointers for the future developments. So it was essentially a trigger for me. I have started, I have started to investigate it deeper. I have uh, started to learn some white papers, some scientific white papers, and it turns out that the whole topic is extremely hot. There are a lot of interesting modifications, a lot of different approaches, uh, and overall this topic is very, very interesting. People are trying to pull you know, B-trees in a various different dimensions mentions, and that's essentially what we're going to talk about. With this talk, I would like to prove that it's an interesting topic, and uh, I really, really hope that at the end uh, of this presentation, you will come up with the very same feeling of excitement that I did a couple of years ago. So here's our agenda. Uh, first of all, we would have to establish some common ground, you know, some, uh, some, some thing, uh, how are we going to reason about B-trees. Then we're going to talk about internals, about various things we could do uh, from this data structure internally. Then we're going to cover a very interesting topic about how uh, B-trees are embraced by some other data structures, so how B-trees are playing as a component of something else. And, uh, well, because it's a pretty much um, hype and buzzword, we're going to talk a little bit about learned indexes and everything else would did not end up in the slides. So, first of all, RAM conjecture. Not sure how many of you have heard about this. RAM conjecture is a very simple thing. It stays for, it stands for a read update memory. So it's essentially a conjecture or like well, it's essentially a conjecture that says that whenever any kind of data uh, index that we would uh, design, data structure that we would design for our indexes, we could optimize only to a certain degree. We cannot optimize all the, the dimensions at once. Uh, all the time when we design something, it means that we have to pick up some particular dimensions. For example, we have to design some data structure that's going to be good for read performance, but then inevitably we just cannot make it so fast that it's going to be good for insert performance, for example. So. Here is a visual representation of this conjecture. We have uh, something called RAM space, where we have uh, three dimensions, where for the, you know, for the diagram and purposes, I replace a update with write, but yeah, it's essentially read, memory footprint, and write efficiency. 
And every time when we design some data structure for indexing, we could optimize at max two of them. Uh, for example, in this particular case, we could say that we have designed such a great data structure that is going to be great for read performance, for read efficiency. It's going to have a quite as well modest uh, memory footprint, but at the same time, inevitably, it means that we're going to lose something when we'll try to update this data structure. And overall, all the data structures, all the indexes that we could actually come up with are going to be landing on this space, on this RAM space as a point closer to one of those corners. So now, having this in mind, let's talk a little bit about B3. So first of all, yeah, we have to establish some uh, definitions here. Every time when we're talking about B trees, we actually normally nowadays talk about B plus tree. So it just doesn't really make sense otherwise, because the only difference is that with B plus tree, you store the actual data, the actual keys we are indexing, and the leaf nodes. That's essentially the only difference. So normally, every time when you see B, B tree, it usually means B plus tree. So again, uh, it's obviously B3 that, uh, it's pretty much obvious that B3 uh, is a, some sort of a tree structure. So we have a different type of nodes. We have, for example, a root node. We have a, some branches node, an intermediate node. And then we have some leaf nodes that are marked on this diagram as a green that actually contain some data. But obviously those nodes are not, you know, they're not abstract. They're not just pages in memory. They also contain some data from within itself. So what is it all about? So on pretty, pretty roughly saying, all those pages, uh, they contain essentially pairs of search key and plus the pointer associated with the search key. Uh, what does it mean? It means that essentially we divide our search space using those search keys. They navigate us through the, this tree, and uh, by, nav uh, by navigating this tree, we essentially follow those pointers one layer at the time uh, until the moment when we find page we actually need to search for, and then we're essentially you know, crunching the data on this page using binary search or something of this sort. Now, uh, the previous version was essentially everything you need to know to actually implement a tree. But the thing is that sometimes in a database world, we actually would like to do an index scan. So essentially, we'd like to scan the whole index for whatever reason, it just happens. For this purpose, it totally makes sense to introduce more pointers between pages, not only parent, uh, ch uh, parent and child, but also it makes sense to introduce a right pointer to the, your right siblings. In this particular uh, situation, when we would like, for example, to perform an index scan, it means that we're essentially going to uh, do one traversal to whatever page we're looking for, and then from this page, just follow right, 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 uh, read all the pages we need. Uh, sure thing, we could also introduce another way around. If we, for example, would like to support an efficient backward index scan, we could introduce a left sibling point, which is actually a very interesting thing because, and it shows a very interesting pattern I'm going to talk about. In B trees as a data structure, there's a, a lot of places when there is certain symmetry expected, but as a, actually this symmetry is not presented. So in this particular case, we think, well, you know, left, right was a difference here. It turns out quite a lot of differences there encoded because with the left pointers, we have to be much, much more careful. Uh, if we are going to do, if we're going to walk these left pointers backwards, pages could be splitting at the same time. Pages are splitting concurrently, unfortunately, which means that we're going to probably end up at some point not where we were expecting to be. And we have to keep this in mind. We have to either implement pretty aggressive locking or as in Postgres we do, we have to sometimes just walk back a little bit. And this version is actually called B link tree. That's, yeah, that's what is, what is implemented in Postgres. And yeah, uh, just normal traversal is going to be from the uh, root node, we pick up one particular search key, we follow the pointer, we find another search key, we follow the pointer, and so on and so forth, until we find the particular data we're looking for. So I already mentioned in context of the links, uh, link pointer, left pointer, uh, page splits. So I have to describe it a little bit more because it's a very, very important topic. Uh, page split is essentially this like a self-balancing feature of B3 and it explained on this diagram. So imagine uh, we have this following situation. Uh, we have a parent node and a child node. And it happened to be that the child node is almost full with the, record, with, the, with the records, with data. And we would like to insert something extra into it. Uh, normally, we prefer to keep our pages in B3 not completely full for essentially to keep this flexibility of being able to insert something more, update something, essentially for space management. Which means in this case, instead of like inserting and making this, uh, this page full, we're going to split it. We're going to allocate a new page in memory. We're going to move approximately half of all the records from the old page to the new one. And what's important, 
we are going to promote a new search key. Uh, essentially, uh, now the point is that we have two uh, pages and we have to somehow be able to distinguish between them. And this distinguishing is happening via this new promoted search key in the parent node. So yeah, page splits. Why is it so important? It's important because it's an overhead. Obviously, not only you have to allocate memory, you have also there is some amount of locking involved and so on and so forth, which means that a lot of different modifications about B trees are actually has something to do with avoiding those page splits or at least trying to postpone them as further as possible. And for example, Peter Gigan did a lot of great job in Postgres recently in recent releases to actually postpone it as much as possible for B tree. Now, again, another very interesting asymmetry in this regard. You may think just from a human perspective, if you have page splits, it totally makes sense to do a page merges, right? Well, it turns out that it doesn't really make sense and sometimes it could be even harmful from the performance perspective. So what nowadays is happening is that most of the database engines there are just trying to utilize available, pay, uh, available memory on the pages, just more efficiently reuse this space when it's happening this way. So, with this picture in mind, it's essentially like the basic outlines of the B trees. So now, uh, let's talk a little bit about optimizations. And the first one is not really optimization, but it's a thing that allows us to introduce more optimizations into B tree, and it's a key normalization. It's a very old thing, actually. It essentially states a very simple thing. Instead of having just literally columns in our index, we're going to replace them with the binary strings that are like with minimum extra information. So in this particular situation, we're going to have uh, one bit representing if the value is null or actually present, and the actual like, binary representation. It sounds simple, but it's going to enable us to do a couple of interesting things. Ah, by the way, before I forgot, every time when you see such a footnote on the slide, that's a reference to a white paper you can check out afterwards for more details about this topic. There are a lot of those white papers in the, in the slides. <laughs> so, prefix truncation. Pretty much, sure thing, prefix truncation is about truncating prefixes. So imagine we have the following data. Two columns, name, some sort of a date, and we would like to index it. So if we're going to index it as it is, you can imagine we're going to have a lot of duplicated data on our uh, pages and B-trees. So we could do actually smarter than that. So there is a, some overlapping. What we could say, and we can, uh, we're going to say essentially, we're going to store this prefix on the page somewhere else, only once. And then the rest of the records on the page are going to essentially refer to this one, uh, some sort of a, like indirection. And uh, via this, we're going to save a little bit space on the pages, on the B-trees, making, at the end of the day, index smaller, fitting in the memory and more efficient for you, for your database. A uh, great thing. But it actually introduces already these changes in the RAM space, because now we have this trade-off about how much memory are we taking versus how much efforts we have to do when we, for example, update values on the page, because now we have to you know, deal with this uh, um, prefix truncation and so on and so forth. And even such a small thing could be done in many various ways. So for example, uh, yeah, on this particular uh, diagram, you see one page with uh, one important node. So you see this red bar at the end. Uh, there is a such thing called fence keys on the pages, which is essentially representing the first, the very first data key on the page, and then the hypothetical high key, which represents the uh, topmost value that could be stored on this page. It means that essentially, using those fence keys, we could deduce what kind of data could we even find potentially on the page. So it's essentially a range what kind of data we could get there. And we could do prefix truncation based on those fence keys. We essentially could say, like, if there is a like, common prefix between those two, let's just cut it, and that's pretty much it. Uh, this is a little bit more efficient, but it could be more fine-grained in a sense that we, for example, could say we would like to truncate prefix more deeply. So you can imagine that there is only one record that does not have this prefix, and all of them are having actually quite a huge prefix. In this case, we're not able to actually apply this optimization. So we could do it more fine grainly but again, it's going to be a trade-off between like how much efforts are we going to spend updating this prefix afterwards versus how much space we're going to save. If we're hesitant to modify anything on the data page, we could do, we still could leverage this optimization. We could say we're going to do a dynamic prefix truncation, which is a quite similar thing, actually. We're saying that we would like to compare some value with our index, uh, with our values on this particular page. Uh, and now we notice again that there is a common prefix following these uh, values uh, that we have on the fence keys. And then we actually don't have to compare this part. We, can, we have to compare only the rest of the values. And uh, via this, we're going to save a little bit performance on this comparison operation. So that's the dynamic prefix truncation. And sure enough, another example of asymmetry, suffix truncation. 
Uh, you may think that it should be something very similar, but it's completely, totally different story. <laughs> yeah, there are many things like that, unfortunately. So imagine we have a page, uh, just a page in memory, B3 page, and this uh, amount of data we have somewhere in the middle. So imagine that this page is about to be splitted. Uh, recall what, were, what was happening when we were splitting the page. We have to promote one extra search key to the parent node. This extra search key is also an overhead, essentially a space that we consume in the memory, you know? And the thing is that thanks to B plus modification of the tree, we don't actually have to store the real value in there. The only requirement is that the search key has to guide us through the space. That's pretty much it. So now, having this in mind, let's take a look what's going on if we're going to split this page right in the middle. It, very, it happens very unfortunate that uh, when we're going to do this right in the middle, to be able to distinguish between those new pages, we actually have to take quite a lot of prefix out of the record because those records are quite alike, you know? There's a lot of repetition again. So just to be able to distinguish between a new and old page, we really have to copy a lot of data. Now imagine that we're not going to be so, uh, you know, so stubborn and we're going to split page somewhere slightly not in the middle but we're going to split, uh, split it somewhere there. And then, since this record is so unique, we could essentially pick up only the first character for the, promoter, for the promoter search key and be done with it. And again, the parent node is going, to be, is going to consume less memory and the index is going to be a little bit more efficient. Another very interesting topic is an indirection vector. Uh, normally, it's actually been utilized uh, even without like an optimization context because it's just a very useful technique for a memory uh, for like a space uh, management on the page. Uh, so uh, what is it all about? Normally, obviously the structure of the B3 page is much more complicated than I was showing before. So we have some header, like you see on this diagram. Then we have this indirection vector, which is essentially just a set of pointers to actual values uh, that are happening to be positioned at the end of the page. They are variable size, they're somehow allocated and so on. Uh, and uh, that's how it looks like, but now here's the thing. Imagine that we're going to enrich this indirection vector with an extra data. For example, we're going to take the first character out of the value which is being pointed by this pointer. So it's actually completely insane. So before we were fighting so hard to actually, you know, cut, cut some slack on the pages. We were fighting so much to actually compress our pages. Now we're going to add some more data. So why is that? The reason is very simple. Uh, imagine we're going to uh, search for some values uh, following this procedure. So if we're going to do this, we have to pick up one uh, indirection vector. In terms of polygraph, it's a line pointer. So we're going to pick up one line pointer and follow the pointer and then compare the value. Then we have to pick up the next pointer, have to compare it with the next value and so on and so forth. As soon as we have an extra information, we actually can compare the value that we have with this prefix. And then if we see that the prefix doesn't really match, we don't even have to follow the pointer. We can skip all this altogether and we can skip all those pointers as soon as we find matching prefix, which is going to save in some certain situations a lot of, uh, a lot of CPU time. And even more than that. With this amount of information, this indirection vector is still quite small. It could fit into the uh, CPU cache, for example, and this whole operation is going to be still quite efficient. So, now you can have this impression that B-trees are perfect in regards to, yeah, you know, they were ubiquitous for 40 years, not for nothing. They're really great in this regard. So the question is why people are actually still trying to come up with something new. So why people are not satisfied with the current, uh, you know, stand of things? To answer these questions, let's take a look at where B3 is located on the RAM space. It's actually located somewhere here, pretty close to the read corner of the thing. So B3s are actually very good for uh, read workload. They are very efficient in this regard, but the memory footprint could be better probably, and update workload could be also a little bit more efficient. So essentially what happens is that uh, B-Trees is a very uh, old and robust data structure. People know how to work with it. People know all the properties, all the you know, trades off. So it sounds very tempting to actually pick up B-Trees for some new use cases and then just adjust it a little bit shift this trade-off to some one on another direction. For example, to make it a little bit more better, like, you know, write optimized or, better, like, for example, memory friendly and so on and so forth. That's essentially what's happening. Plus, all the emerging hardware has to be also adapted or, like, B-trees have to be adapted to all the emerging hardwares and so on. Uh, another very interesting topic is even, even the index creation is not that straightforward actually. And here's an example that I really like because of the title. It's called uh, Waves of Misery After Index Creation. Uh, 
uh, it's a real scientific paper, no joke, I'm not kidding here. Uh, so yeah, th there are a lot of pain points actually with B-trees, although they're really great. So now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the second part, about B-trees as a part of something else. So, but before, uh, a little bit quiz for you folks, so quiz time. Uh, here's a set of just a table of various terms and uh, definitions that I have found while doing my research. Uh, some of them are real, some of them are fake. I just came, came up with these definitions. So question for you, can you recognize uh, which of those terms actually are nonsense? Any, any guesses? Any ideas? History. Yeah, okay, yeah, sounds weird, right? <laughs> any other clues, any other suggestions? Mastery, yeah, the weird one, the worst one. <laughs> okay, the bitter truth is that all of them are real. I just have not enough like fantasy to come up with all of this stuff. <laughs> so uh, that essentially shows you that mm, there are so many different options on the table and the researchers are going crazy coming up with the various different optimizations and modifications. And so far we have actually covered only the classical part of things. So B tree, B plus tree, B link tree, like normal one, right? So in the following couple of slides, I just pick up a couple of those that are actually embracing B trees as a part of the bigger picture. So we're going to talk about BW tree, DP tree, partition tree, and hybrid B tree. So partition B tree is actually a thing that actually grew up out of this idea. Let's try to optimize index creation. It's actually a suggestion behind this wave of misery paper. An idea is again very counterintuitive. Again, let's add an extra data to our B tree. So why is that? We would like to have our B trees as small as possible, and those authors are, uh, those authors are actually suggesting let's add a new artificial leading key. So essentially, let's add more data to our B tree. So what's the point? The point is that when we have this artificial leading key, we actually can uh, artificially partition our B tree. And that could, turns out to be a very useful approach. For example, when we create uh, an index, just a normal B tree index, usually it's being created using merge sort. And this merge sort is producing a lot of runs, like you know, temporary runs, result of this, that at the end of the day they are getting merged together to produce a final tree. So the thing is that those partial runs, the, the result of those merge sort, are actually already like a part of this whole B tree. They're already searchable to a certain degree. So the authors actually question why do not use this uh, opportunity? Why to not link those parts together and say that they are going to be already one particular B tree, just like a different parts of it? Uh, in this regard, it means that we're going to partition it, for example, like in this case, into three parts. Those are going to be three results of those merge sorts. And then if we would like to search through this, we, okay, yeah, okay, we have to iterate through those partitions. It's going to be a linear process, but it's still just three of them. It's not that much, right? And right after that, we're just going to essentially do a normal B tree search. And then at the end of the day, as soon as all the, uh, all the procedures are done, we could essentially just merge them together, restoring balance of the force. And Interestingly enough, via this, we could actually reduce amount of time. Uh, how long does it take to actually prepare an index by almost twice? Obviously, it means that there is going to be a certain trade-offs as soon as this, uh, as long as the tree is not prepared, the search parts of it is going to be a little bit slower, but nevertheless, it's going to be functional and serving its purpose. Another very interesting modification of this is an idea about separation of cold part of the B trees versus a hot part of the B tree. So uh, these uh, authors are suggesting very interesting thing, very interesting pattern that we're going to see throughout all the following uh, articles. They're saying let's create one partition that we're going to put somewhere in the fast memory. This partition is going to be a small one. This B tree is going to be a really small one. It's going to locate it in the best hardware we have and it's going to accumulate all the inserts into our B tree. That is a sort of, to a certain degree, going to address this uh, situation Situation that overhead of inserting data into B3 is a little bit no, suboptimal. So if we have um, this partition, hot partition, we could accumulate efficiently stuff in there, and then every now and then we're going to uh, merge uh, all of this stuff from our hot partition into an immutable cold part of the B3, which is going to be, well, one or many other partitions. So the difference is that in this particular case, this partition is persistent in a sense that it's not going to disappear after some times, while in the previous case, it was like a transient partition. So, now hybrid indexes. 
The ID is quite similar to the, uh, to the previous one. So again, we have a cold B3, which is a main part of the B3, immutable B3. And by the way, there are a lot of also things on the tables when we know that we are not going to modify our data. We can even like, you know, make more aggressive choices about trade-offs. So this is going to take even less space than usual. And then we have a second part of the equation, which is theoretically could be any data structure we would like, but in this particular case, sure enough, authors went with a normal B3 that just, yeah, it's going to be a little bit smaller, more, more efficient B3. And to address the problem that we have to check both of those trees when we search for something, they also introduce a bloom index. So essentially, it means that as soon as we would like to search for some particular record, we have to first consult bloom, uh, bloom filter that will essentially efficiently tell us if the record is not present in the hot part, so we could immediately go to the call to mute part of the B3 to search there. And now as soon as we insert the data, like no magic here, we're going to essentially accumulate all the changes into our fast B3 and then merge it from time to time into the mutable part. A very similar idea from a different perspective is also proposed for, uh, from the authors of BW3. It's actually, well, th it's very interesting. I think it was implemented a couple of times, but at the end of the day proved not really performant, but at the same time, the idea is very, very interesting. So essentially what authors are saying, let's introduce another level of indirection. So normally when we link all those pages together, uh, they are linked by physical addresses, right? Physical pointers. The authors are saying, let's, uh, let's replace those with the logical pointers, which is like literally logical IDs, and then create a separate table in the memory that are going to map these logical pointers to the real memory pointers. So, what does it give us? It turns out it's actually quite a powerful approach. This level of indirection from one point of view, obviously, it's like, you know, it's an overhead. We have to do this pointer chasing thingy. But at the same time, let's see what happens when we would like to update our data. Imagine we have this situation, we have one particular page in uh, B3, and we would like to insert something or update something. Uh, instead of actually doing this in place, now, following the authors, we could actually create a delta record. So it's going to be just a record, like sort of a, like a log of our change that happens to the page, but without actually merging it inside. Uh, and then, using compare and swap operation, we're just going to install this new pointer into our, our indirection table without like, any efforts whatsoever. So this atomic operation is going to be fast, and essentially now we are pointing not to the original page, but to this delta record. So that every time, when, for example, we would like to examine this page, we first have to examine the delta record, and then the actual page. It sounds very interesting because the insert part is again getting more and more efficient, but obviously when we're accumulating more and more those delta records, the search part is getting to be, you know, is going to have a hit in terms of performance. So again, the very same approach. From time to time, we're going to merge those chains of deltas into a single page and again, install it using just a simple compare and swap operation. So at the end of the day, the idea is very simple. It's the very same idea as before, cold versus hot data, but just apply it on the, you know, on the page level. And this is a very interesting example that shows us how B-trees could be adjusted to a modern you know, emerging hardware. So db tree is actually a modification proposed for B-trees to work on non-volatile memory, so on persistent memory. And actually, the first parts of it are very similar. So we have, again, uh, an immutable call tree. Uh, we have another structure, which is also a tree, which is going to be immutable and small and hot and contains insurance and so on. And the first difference that we have from the previous examples is that now we have this dashed line. This dashed line represents a difference between persistent and non-persistent memory. Everything that lies above is a non-persistent memory, just a regular memory, and everything that lies below it is a persistent memory. So, uh, as you can see, all the leaf nodes in our trees are actually leaving their leaf in the persistent memory for essentially for crash recovery purposes. And, well, the statement is that all the branch nodes actually could be more or less easily uh, recovered after the crash recovery, restored from those leaf nodes. One interesting part here is that actually our insert tray, our small uh, like accumulator, is not leaving any traces whatsoever on persistent memory. So what's happening on the crash recovery? Well, we have to handle this somehow. So they uh, propose just a normal log to capture changes that are happening to this tree, which is actually some sort of a contention thingy, but still very interesting suggestion. And at the end of the day, sure enough, 
We have, first of all, when we would like to read something from this tree, we have to consult the first part, the hot part, then the second part if we haven't found anything. And all the inserts are going to be accumulated in the first hot part and merge uh, from time to time to the main part. And what I would like to uh, point your attention is that uh, we've got pretty much the same picture as before, although the underlying hardware is completely different, which is mind-blowing, so we have completely different uh, system on, which, on top of which we have built something and still we end up with a some quite similar uh, structure. Yep. And now a little bit about learned indexes. So you may ask, you may like wonder why am I even going to talk about this? First of all, because there was a really nice talk yesterday about this. And uh, the second is that they're not really, you know, they're not really playing around with the trees, right? They're trying to replace them. So what's the point? Well, yeah, the first one, yeah, is they are pretty popular. I would like to get more popularity for this talk, that's obvious. Uh, and the second part is that actually a relationship between B trees and learned indexes are actually much, well, a little bit more interesting than that, let's say it this way. So just to remind you, uh, what is a learned index? Uh, the proposal is very interesting. Uh, let's take a look at the index as a whole um, from the model perspective. So essentially the statement is that the index is essentially just a model that allows us somehow to map a search key to a, a page in memory, to a data that we're actually searching for. And in case of B3, it just happened to be that this model is a B3. There's nothing particular about it, not, nothing special. So the question is, how could we actually replace this model? Could we propose something different? And the authors from the very popular case for uh, learned indexes are actually suggesting to use neural network, which is essentially uh, a neural network that's going to learn your data. Uh, your, it's going to learn your data distribution at the end of the day and provide you some neural network that are going to point you pretty much like a normal index in one or another place with certain uh, error boundaries. Uh, interesting part is happening when, uh, well, there is a separate part for this proposal, uh, when the net neural, network, neural network is so good, it has learned the data so good that the error precision is pretty much like it's within the acceptable threshold. And in this case, author, authors are essentially suggesting let's just go the hybrid mode and let's just produce a B3 out of it. So essentially, we've got a neural network, the network that generates a B3 for you, which is a very interesting approach. Why not? And Another very, very interesting and fascinating approach based on something called fitting tree, for example, is again about learning your data distribution, but in a little bit different way. Uh, so now let's think about the data in this graph representation. So essentially when we're talking about the index, we have this uh, matching between position in the index on the uh, y-axis versus key space on the x-axis. So essentially it's a, at the end of the day, this data distribution is simply a function quite complicated, obviously, function, sort of a, uh, like a cumulative distribution function, but nevertheless a normal function. And this function could be approximated to a certain degree. Uh, like on this example, for example, you can see we're trying to optimize it with pi, uh, piecewise linear functions. And using this approach, we could do a very interesting thing that's absolutely mind-blowing. Instead of creating the full index, we're going to store only those segments. We're going to store the segment of the data and slope, so just two values essentially, instead of create, like you know storing all those values in our index, and it gives us a very interesting new uh, parameter to tune. Now we can say, okay, we're going to store this data. We're going to use this data to find some position in the index, and now we could say, uh, please create a B tree or sorry, please create an index that's going to be fuzzy enough with a little bit more errors, for example, but it's going to like you know take uh, almost nothing in memory. Or other way around, we could say create a super Super precise index, but okay, it's going to take a little bit more space in the memory. So having this, uh, having said this, uh, at the end of the day, we're going to store all those segments actually in still in form of a tree in our structure. So trees are still somewhere there under the hood. Uh, yep, and well, yeah. What do you think? Is that all? Uh, did I cover all the structures, all the indexes, all the modifications? Yeah. Obviously, obviously, no. There's no way we're going to do this uh, in like what 30, 40 minutes. Uh, just a couple of interesting pointers for you. If you're curious, just check them out. They're very interesting. Uh, I found a couple of them are really fascinating. And yeah, uh, last but not least, uh, I have put a lot of references to various uh, white papers. But there's also a very interesting book called Database Internals. Uh, disclaimer, I have nothing to do with the authors. He's not paying me, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, this, pay, this book has really a great, a great chapter on the B3 indexes. So just go and check that out. Uh, and that's pretty much it. I hope at this point you have a lot, lot of questions.
Yeah, please. Yep, this one. So the question was about uh, having this in mind, having this cumulative distribution function in mind, could we use it to actually deduce some properties about how well balanced our B3 is, right? Yeah. So um, I'm not sure that that's actually a correct question in the sense that this distribution is actually B3 independent in this sense. And since B3 is self-adapting, it's going to be more or less finely adapting to any kind of distributions we have. Although you're right, we still could deduce something about some properties about B3. For example, we could see that like, mm, yeah, we could see, for example, some other properties of B-trees, like, for example, how many levels are we going to have, what kind of, what is going to be a data distribution within the pages, that could be derived, that's true. Yep, very interesting question. So, the question is about whether or not it's possible to uh, use and apply various optimizations for B-trees in case if we have an encrypted data. So, essentially, when we store something encrypted in our B-trees. Uh, it's actually a very um, hot topic nowadays, especially since Postgres as a community is trying to implement various ap approaches to encrypting the data to satisfy various requirements and so on. And the problem here is that as soon as we encrypt something, it's essentially a black box for the database, from the database point of view. It depends on how do we encrypt stuff, but the normal way of thinking is that we just encrypt stuff on the page, and at the end of the day we have essentially just like, for example, B3 of encrypted data. It makes stuff quite a lot of complicated for many reasons for planners, for B-trees. So in this regard, I'm not sure if it's even possible to apply any kind of modifications that are working on the page level. To answer your question, unfortunately, I have never stumbled upon such, you know, such, such, such work. Maybe it's actually an interesting thing to think about this. Maybe we need to take a look at this again. <laughs> Yep, so uh, actually, I'm not entirely sure how other people are thinking about this, so to repeat the question. First of all, the question is about, since we're talking about trade-offs uh, trade between uh, memory consumption and, for example, read efficiency, how does it play around with I.O. operations? So how does it play around with how much I.O. are we doing to maintain this B3? So I'm not sure how other folks are thinking about this. When I'm thinking about this topic, I'm thinking about this from pretty much a practical point of view. B-trees has to be fit into memory. That's essentially the law of managing, like, or at least the hot data set of B-tree has to be fitting into memory. At least all the branch nodes and all the hot leaves node has to be there. Uh, about more fine-grained approach, well, essentially the point is that even if everything is fitting, it's still better to have B-tree smaller because normally when, for example, a data is fragmented in memory, it's still not very nice because, for example, if we have a lot, a lot of pages scattered around the whole sentence, we're going to, for example, have a lot of transaction look-aside buffer uh, pressure, so TLB pressure, and it's going to be a very, very nasty situation. So even when everything fits into the memory, that could be uh, very nice to actually keep everything together. And at the end of the day, well, I mean, for B-trees, it's probably not that important but some smaller data structure could sometimes even benefit, for example, from even lower size things like, for example, CPU level caches or something like that. So, any other questions? Great. Then, if you have more questions, you can catch me in the hall. And thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>